Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. A low amount of money has been raised and spent on this election. It's easy for voters to miss and it's easy for voters not to care. Whether they care is up for debate. What you can expect from those who do vote seems clear. We'll break it down. He was then considered, this was in court testimony, the most important DEA agent in the history of the agency. The story of Baton Rouge drug smuggling pilot Barry Seal has caught on in theaters. The TV journalist who may have known Seal best separates the silver screen version from the one he saw firsthand. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. In a moment, more on this weekend's election, how they could play out, and the real Barry Seal story, which gripped international headlines three decades ago. But first, here are other stories making news. LSU police took 10 fraternity members into custody and all were booked into East Baton Rouge Parish Prison on charges of hazing as they investigate the alleged hazing death of a freshman student. One of those 10 also faces charges of negligent homicide. 18-year-old Georgia native Max Groover, who wanted to be a sports writer and who was only 24 days into his freshman year at LSU, was found unresponsive at the now disbanded Phi Delta Theta House September 13th. He was taken to a hospital where he died later that day. The East Baton Rouge Parish coroner found at the time of his death, Groover's blood alcohol was at highly elevated levels, more than six times the legal limit for drivers. Sexually transmitted diseases have increased across the U.S. for a third consecutive year, and Louisiana ranked second highest for each of the three STDs measured. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that Louisiana has the second highest rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Wednesday was World Obesity Day. Research and awareness is an ongoing task at Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Baton Rouge. Louisiana is the fifth most obese state in America, with 35% of our adults considered obese. One in three of our children are already overweight or obese. It is estimated obesity costs the state $3 billion annually. Y.A. Tittle, one of LSU's quarterbacking greats and Pro Football Hall of Famer, died of natural causes Sunday night at a Palo Alto, California hospital. Tittle was last honored in Tiger Stadium in 2014 when the Tigers hosted Mississippi State. He became a two-time All-SEC pick, playing at LSU from 1944 to 47, and a year later, in 1948, was inducted into LSU's Hall of Fame. Tittle starred with the 49ers and Giants in 17 professional seasons. This photograph from 1964 epitomizes him as the NFL warrior he was. Dazed and bloodied, it is one of the most iconic images of 20th century sports journalism. The great Y.A. Tittle was 90 years old. Monroe was the latest stop this week for Governor John Bell Edwards as he continued his statewide tour, meeting with business leaders and elected officials to get input about stabilizing and reforming the state budget. It's all in an effort to avoid the upcoming $1 billion fiscal cliff facing Louisiana. The governor has led similar meetings in Acadiana, Shreveport, Bossier, New Orleans, Alexandria, Homa, Baton Rouge, and the North Shore. Also in the news, an historic change from the Boy Scouts of America that will naturally impact those scouts in New Louisiana, and this would begin next year. The unanimous approval for the scouts to admit girls into the Cub Scouts and to establish a new program for older girls that would enable them to earn the coveted rank of Eagle Scout. Well, Saturday, October 14th is an election day across Louisiana, though the Secretary of State says many people don't seem to know about it or perhaps simply don't care. 
With me to talk about this right now is Sue Lincoln, Louisiana political reporter, NPR, and also John Cuvial from JMC Analytics and Polling. John, let me ask you first, what does this data about early voting tell you? So I've always found that early voting is a fairly good prognosticator of ultimate turnout. And what I'm seeing is that early voting turnout for this primary is about 50% lower than it was in the December 2016 runoff. And that election cycle itself had a very low turnout of 29.5%. So I'm forecasting very low turnout, probably in the low teens. In the low teens? Correct. Okay, we heard the Secretary of State say 20% earlier uh, when I spoke with him. He said that he thought that could go to the mid-teens. What I think happened is that as early voting was going on, the pattern of how many were early voting on each day indicated there was going to be a much lower turnout than originally thought. Plus, the early voting numbers were skewed on the first day by an avalanche of mail-in ballots, which normally are 20% of the total, but on the first day of early voting, it was 62%. So that artificially inflated the first day numbers. But as time went on, it's fairly clear that there's a very low level of interest in the race. And that's why I think the Secretary of State revised his turnout assumptions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sue, well, you are heavily involved in covering this uh, from all angles from the Capitol. Uh, what's your take on what you're saying? What my take is is that the voters, like you said, don't know or maybe even don't really care. The treasurer's race is not what we would call a sexy race, even though some of the candidates have tried to make it so by parlaying John Kennedy's watchdog and catchy phrases into their own MO, into their own campaigns. So it's, and the other thing is possibly voter fatigue. We have, this was supposed to be an off year. We weren't supposed to have right. a big election this year. So there may be just, they don't really care about the treasurer's race. After all, what can the treasurer do to really affect change in Louisiana. Well, let me ask you this too. When you hear the candidates talk about, uh, whether it's treasurer or public service commissioner, they talk about their role uh, when they speak to press clubs and some of the media junkets, which have not been far reaching, but we've seen them, uh, at least in the capital city. They don't really say what they are going to do. Their answers have seemed to be very benign and very, I'm, I'm not liberal. I'm conservative, I'm this, I'm that, but it doesn't really say I'm gonna get in there and do this specifically. W what's your thought on that? My thought on that is that given that this is a race where the duties of a treasurer, just like the duties of a PSC member, are very tough to articulate to the average voter, I think that's why you have an entertainment aspect to it, like what you've seen. The other thing, too, that makes it difficult to communicate about what the treasurer does is, given the election fatigue that you had referenced, I think that donors are more reluctant to give money to the candidates in this race. And when you have less money going around, that also means less uh, money being spent on the airwaves to communicate your message. So therefore, you end up taking a more theatrical tack than you would have perhaps if this were, say, a race for U.S. Senator or Governor. Well, you certainly mentioned that. We have seen fewer signs, certainly, hardly in yards at all, in some vacant lots. Uh, I think we've seen signs. Uh, uh, TV commercials, are they even existent? There are several TV commercials out there, but there is limited air time availability because, as John spoke to, the funding that goes into this. Those major donors are probably holding back somewhat to see who makes it to the runoff because of the top names, we have three Republicans and one Democrat. It's pretty much assumed yes. that the one Democrat is going to make it in, and he has the least amount of money available. At the end of the last reporting period, he had less than $700 still available to run the rest of his exactly. race. The other candidates are all three Republicans, and they're fighting it out for that other runoff spot. And they're all going from pretty much the same premise of, I'm going to be the state's watchdog. Right, right. Well, I want to hold you here for one moment, because we also spoke with Dr. Joshua Stockley, who is the Associate Professor of Political Science at UL Monroe, to get his take on the expected low turnout of voters and what seems to be a general lack of interest. Here's what he said. 
Voters aren't paying attention to politics right now. We just came off a contested, divisive, polarized presidential election. So I think there's a little bit of voter fatigue and voter burnout. On top of that, the only thing on the ballot statewide is a treasurer's race and three constitutional amendments. Constitutional amendments don't excite voters. And this treasurer's race hasn't excited the voters either. Now that's in part because of the candidates themselves. They have not raised a lot of money. They have not spent a lot of money. And because they haven't spent a lot of money, we're not seeing a lot of statewide advertising. We're not seeing much in the way of signs. So it's easy to think that there is no election this fall. Now Stockley also pointed out that much of the nation has been preoccupied with hurricanes since the beginning of August dominating the news cycle. Nevertheless, voters will go to the polls this weekend. I want to thank everybody involved here for this conversation. It, it is fascinating. It's interesting to see the dynamics of it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Andre. A reminder, polls open Saturday at 7 a.m. They close at 8 p.m. Roughly 1,400 people returned home from prison this month under new reform laws passed in the spring. Now, in addition to the hurdles that come with adjusting to life on the outside, they will likely face unexpected challenges. LPB's Kelly Spires is here with part of our continuing series on poverty and opportunity in America, Chasing the Dream. Kelly? That's right. A lawyer I spoke with says her clients commonly confront unexpected traffic tickets they haven't been able to sort out while in prison. That can add up to th tens of thousands of dollars of debt. I visited a nonprofit in New Orleans helping people get back on their feet. For a living, Derek Parikh helps people improve their sight. He owns his own business, Custom Optical, and makes one-of-a-kind glasses. He also helps formerly incarcerated people improve their outlook on life. He's a program coordinator with two nonprofits called the First 72 Plus and Rising Foundations. When I was released, um, it was very little support um, beyond my family. As I grew and being released and with getting the employment, starting a business and everything, I noticed that that was something that, that was needed and that I was a perfect person to do it since I had to go through the struggle alone. Parikh learned how to make glasses while in Angola. He won't ever be an optometrist. His record prevents that. But one day, with his growing business, he can hire one. In addition to that, there's his own job security. That independence it is, it, it's a relief. Um, you know one thing, um, this guy can't fire me because of my convictions. I am the guy to do the fire. And the first step on the road home is often getting a driver's license. Despite the hurdles, it's too risky not to, Parikh says. Well, that means everything. I mean, your life is on the line as well as your, your employment, because um, if you miss days of work, you, you can't um, show up to, to the job behind not having a driver's license and you're in jail. Terrell Scott is one of those trying to get back on his feet. He currently works mornings as a hopper on the back of a garbage truck, but his specialty is cars. I really need a driver's license because I do body work on cars, like I fix it on cars, so even in the car shop, we have to like drive the cars around and you need driver license for it. Kelly Oriens is executive director of the organization and attorney for those it serves. That a driver's license is one of the most crucial tools that a formerly incarcerated person needs to get back on their feet and it's also one of the hardest to attain. Scott was one of her first clients with the program. She had nine clients in her first year with 115 tickets between them. Of those 115, all but two of them were for non-moving violations. So these were for violations that did not really necessarily impact public safety. Orion's first has to negotiate with the traffic courts in each parish where her clients may have had an infraction. Her clients typically get on a payment plan. Scott's issues were average. They dropped like all the tickets from 7,000 down and I had one ticket out of town. And it was just easy, like this court, I was out with them like $500 for one stop. I called the judge and she faxed a receipt over like in an hour. She was no problem. Huh? But often, just when things are looking up, there's another problem. The Office of Motor Vehicles levies more fees on top of that for every ticket already resolved with traffic court. When you're dealing with the Office of Motor Vehicles as opposed to traffic court, the Office of Motor Vehicles maintains they have no discretion. These are state statutes that mandate that these fines or fees are owed. 
If her clients miss a payment, it can put them back at square one. If you miss one single payment, even by just a couple of days, a warrant is issued for your arrest, a hundred plus dollar contempt charge is added to your debt, and your driver's license is immediately suspended. So Orians and Parikh have a new plan to help. We are now starting a um, communal loan fund, um, and that would help the guys to get those payments down um, and out of the way, and they're no longer at threat of being arrested again for a traffic ticket that um, grew outstanding while they were in prison. The fund is also a way to inspire community. You're around that energy was positive, guys trying to strive for better, do better. Um, so it, it gives you an, another comfort. Um, financially, yes, it's important, but the support and everything that comes with being in a group is valued just as equal. Another element to the project, Parikh manages a small business incubator that will help clients get the income to pay back the fund and find their own independence. We also um, offer the small business incubator. We're helping guys um, start their own businesses. Um, first, it starts out as supplement income um, with the hopes of it blossoming to a, a full-time um, job and business. Once Scott got over the seemingly insurmountable hurdle of getting a license, he felt like he could do anything and do it right. He supplements his hopper income with a business called Flight Night Window Tinting. It's like a start of some. By me getting a drive license, it just really helped me go forward. Like I feel like I could do so much more. Because at first, before cost raise, I ain't even never thought about even going to get a drive license. I didn't want to do nothing. I wanted to just do what I wanted to do. Orion says there's additional work the legislature could do. She'd like to see lawmakers prohibit those extra fees from the OMV. We should make it easier for formerly incarcerated people in particular to get credit for time served. For If they go to prison, they're going to prison for something criminal related and it's so serious that we're going to take their freedom away and put them in a state prison, that should probably satisfy any issues that they have. It's not just the quality of vision Parikh wants to improve, but he also wants to change how people see folks like him. If a, if a person sees me, I have tattoos on my hands, my neck and different things, they look at it as normally, oh, he must be a, maybe a gang member, a drug dealer. But instead, hey, I can still wear a t-shirt and some jeans and run a business just to change that perspective of a person's look. The story is a part of a collaboration with other stations across the country. The series called Chasing the Dream is about poverty and opportunity in America. You can find more stories like it online at the address on your screen. Andre? All right, interesting stuff, Kelly. Thank you very much for that. And funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by the JPB Foundation and also by the Ford Foundation. A Tom Cruise movie now in theaters is based on a real-life character from Louisiana, Baton Rouge-born pilot Barry Seal. Award-winning TV journalist John Camp had the chance to report on Seal, and for me, he separated the facts from the Hollywood fiction. In his investigative report, Murder of a Witness, retired TV journalist John Camp sat with Barry Seal in the cockpit of his airplane and learned what made him tick. The cost of... Uh of living an exciting life is high. Uh, you can't sit in Baton Rouge and uh, go to work from 9 to 5 on Monday through Friday and go to the LSU football games on Saturday night and church on Sunday morning and have an exciting life. That may be exciting to 99% of the population, but to me, it's not. Excitement to me was being in life-threatening situations. It was one of the classic uh, sound bites of the, uh, the piece. Once again, our lead story, Barry Seal, an airline pilot turned drug smuggler and soldier of fortune, has been assassinated. Seal's life ended in February of 1986. Less than two years before, Camp recalls how he came to have a front row seat into the most controversial story he'd ever covered. I received a telephone call in 1984 in September uh, from a guy who said, 
I'm a former TWA pilot. I'm the biggest drug smuggler in the United States. I am the greatest informant ever for the Drug Enforcement Agency. And I have done this, that, and everything, and you need to talk to me. And I thought I was talking to a lunatic, but uh, he pushed me and kept talking, talking, talking. So uh, I said, okay, I'll come pay you a visit. I was expecting to end up going to a place for mental health. Instead, he found a high-priced home with an affluent Baton Rouge address and a Mercedes-Benz in the driveway. Greeted at the door by a uh, relatively short, fat guy who certainly didn't fill the role of all the things he bragged about, and it was Barry Seal. The director of this film says it is a fun lie based on a true story. My wife had to hold my arm down. <laughs> because I wanted to leave about midway in the movie. It was, you know, such a fantasy. An example of one thing that really happened and that Camp saw firsthand, SEAL flew Camp and a news crew to Miami to watch and record a secret meeting with drug agents. I received a uh, sum of $10,000 today in cash in $100 bills. Uh, payment uh, received uh, in payback of a loan that I made to a DEA operative who's working in this uh, covert operation at this time. Barry Seal was a smuggler who got caught and didn't want to go to prison. And he had contacts beyond anything that anyone that the DEA knew of had ever established. And he uh, became a witness seeking to protect himself from going to prison. He was then considered, this was in court testimony, the most important DEA agent in the history of the agency. The Army brought in the uh, truckloads, duffel bags full of cocaine, and they were loaded on board the aircraft by the Cuban and Sandinista soldiers. Camp says he personally liked SEAL, even if he didn't agree with some of his life choices. Attempting to ascertain who is to blame for the blunders leading to the murder of a witness as significant as Barry Seal is not nearly as important as taking steps to ensure other government witnesses are not placed in similar jeopardy. He felt that he was being taken advantage of by local authorities. He was already given almost a free ride by uh, drug agents in Miami and he was providing them with uh, actually very important information about the Medellin cartel which was the largest uh, shipper of cocaine in the world at the time. And he felt that uh, the immunity he received in Miami should apply for Louisiana. And for reasons I have never understood, there was no intervention by the U.S. Justice Department to determine why one agency was doing everything it could to convict him, keeping him under almost 24-hour surveillance here in Baton Rouge, and another agency was, you know, singing his praises and promising him immunity. It was unfortunate that the Justice Department did not get the full impact of who he could have brought down and what, he could, have, what could have occurred in stopping cocaine traffic into this country. Whether you call it soldier fortune or, or what, it's, uh, it's a way of life for me. I enjoy it. I, I'm going to keep doing it. The two investigative specials done by John Camp at WBRZ-TV can be seen right now online. Just go to ladigitalmedia.org and search for Barry Seal. You know, thousands attended the 6th Louisiana Film Prize Festival this past weekend in Shreveport with a Shreveport native and his short film taking home the top prize. The Louisiana Film Prize is unique in that it requires filmmakers to produce their films in northwest Louisiana. Also unique is that the winner receives the largest cash award of any film festival. It's something that has kind of helped us to bridge the gap between times when there may be uh, not as active of film projects going on or, you know, when an event season is slower. It, it's kind of filled in those holes and kept excitement up, kept the creativity going, and it's just overall been a, a brilliant way to set up an, a, a festival like this. Exit Strategy, directed by Shreveport native Travis Bible, took the big prize among the 20 film finalists this year. 
His movie got the most votes from the thousands attending the festival and who watched and who voted on all the finalists. I'm so excited to be here. This really is one of the cooler film festivals, probably the coolest film festival I've, I've been to, so it's, it's a lot of fun. So. And it's not as hot now as when I shot my movie, so that's great too. <laughs> La Prize is a hot spot for emerging filmmakers to develop their craft. The festival itself has also emerged into a more complete event. It is holding on to its name, Louisiana Film Prize, but the addition of attractions means bigger crowds and more money. In year one, we were just Film Prize, and like I said, we had 400 festival attendees, but now we've added film, or music and food, and um, we, music speaks to a certain group, but food speaks to everybody. So we're seeing quite a lot of people from all demographics come down to the area, and you're, you feel Shreveport come alive. For more info on the film prize or if you're interested in becoming involved, check out prizefest.org. And that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. And also, please like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.